my name is Marguerite Tonery and from Thrives Press. And today we are talking to Lali Bibé, um, our translator from France. Um, you're very welcome, Lali. Hi, thank you. And Lali, you translated the yeah. children's picture book, Silly Sammy, uh, from English to French. The one thing that I stood out for me about this book is that when you translated it, um, the title, so the word silly doesn't exist in French. It doesn't translate well because in English, silly is like a little bit stupid, foolish, but it can be, it can be in a kind of cute way. It's not necessarily pejorative, I think. Yeah. But in French, like you have many words to say that someone is stupid or an idiot, but it is pejorative. So mm -hmm. it wouldn't have worked if we had translated the title literally, like it would have, it would have been very, no. <laughs> Insulting, yeah. Yeah. So, so what, what did the title become? So Silly Sammy became Sammy Sans Dessus Dessous. And that is, tell the, tell the listeners um, what that is, sounds more like Silly Sammy the Clown or Silly Sammy? Uh, sans Dessus Dessous means upside down. Oh, and we thought it was a good way of translating the idea of Siri mm. because Sammy makes a mess everywhere she goes and she leaves everything upside down. So it was a good way of giving the idea and without translating Siri. And there's quite a playfulness about that. Yeah, and because we also have an alliteration, an S, we have mm. Sammy Ponsu Dessous, so many S, and uh, it's a nice like sonority for children. And, sorry. Um, oh when you were translating it, it is. I often think that for a translator to be able, well, it's true that if a person is translating from one language to their native, their mother tongue, that they need to be proficient in both languages mm -hmm. because of um, there are nuances of languages of language that can really affect like it's not google translate we're doing here oh, it's, it, you have to be a translator so you have to understand the nuances of the language mm -hmm. and you have to understand the colloquial terms you have to understand and the feeling or the emotion that's being brought through in a book in order to understand that you really need to be proficient in both languages i believe how did you find that how did you find the translation from English to French, because you spent time in Ireland. Yep. Tell us about that. So you were here in Ireland, you learned words that you would never hear ordinarily in the English language, like that you learn in school. So yes. um, what did you think of the terms, the Irish terms, or what do you think of the English? Once you landed in this country and you were speaking to the people here, what did um, you find? I, at the beginning, I first came to Ireland um, a few months before I actually started working there. I was looking for an apartment. And the first time I went to Dublin, I went to a museum and there was a tour and I didn't understand anything. But before that, I had been to, I had been studying in Finland and uh, classes were in English. So I was used to speaking English and I couldn't understand everything. But all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, I'm going to be working there and I, I don't understand anything they're saying. What is this accent? It's horrible. But it was just one guy. Actually, it was just one man. Because then when I started working in a school, it was much, much easier. But um, it's true that when I was maybe texting people, I would always have to check on urban dictionary for mm -hmm. words because... Well, there's slang and also just Irish sayings. Yeah, I think you're, you know, I just, I remember I was talking to somebody, another translator there today, actually, and it's something simple like a torture mock in Irish translates literally in English to giving out. Well, giving out in, if you were to, under, if you were to stand as a French woman and in Ireland and say giving out, what am I, what are you giving to me? Like, what are you giving out? But it actually means to complain. Um, I have learned. Mm -hmm. 
So um, I imagine that it was quite difficult to just pick up those little terms. But you did, you managed it? Well, some of them, not all of them. Sometimes I hear something and I'm like, yeah. I don't know what they're talking about, but some of them, yeah. And um, what did you, how did you find um, the translation of Silly Sammy? How did you, how did you navigate your way through this book? Well, I really liked it. And I think when you first think of it, you believe that it's going to be easy because there are very few words mm -hmm. compared to a novel or some longer book. It's a children's book. Words are simple. There are few words. It's going to be easy. But it's not because there are few words, but every word is chosen carefully to give an atmosphere and yeah, they're chosen carefully. So when you translate them, you have to choose your words carefully as well and make sure that everything the author tried to say without writing it is also conveyed in your translation. So yeah. it was quite challenging, but it was very interesting. I think that's something important you've hit on there, that when um, it's a very, people look at children's picture books and think, wow, there aren't many words. Anybody could write that. It's very yep. difficult to write a children's yep. picture book because how do you tell a whole story in such, a, like in so few words? And it's, it's a particular skill to be able to do that, I think, because I'm used to writing um, larger books like large fiction um, so I get to tell the story but it's like in 320 pages or something but then you get the story and it's full pages black and white fiction and yet to be able to tell a full story in just a few words is what you're saying it's packed full every word has significance every word has meaning and that has to be a challenge when you're translating to another language yeah, because we, we just can't lose anything mm. in a translation. Um, it's not just, as you said, it's not just translating literally, you're also translating, yeah, the atmosphere and... The emotion and... The, yeah, the emotions. Yeah. And the flow, even to maintain a flow is, is, can be a challenge because a book has to flow at a certain pace. Um, sometimes it's slow, sometimes the book is fast but it has to flow at a certain pace. And I suppose when you translate from one language to the other to try and maintain that flow, that pace, must mm -hmm. be um, quite a skilled thing to do. Like it has to be quite skilled because you're trying to use French words. And one thing I understand about, because I know Irish. So in our, Irish is very descriptive language. So we may need three or four words to say one English word. Mm -hmm. And I often think like that with English language, it almost has one word for every blooming thing that's out there. There seems to be a one word for everything and um, a new word. Oh, and I think till the day I die, I will still be learning new English words um, and I never know them all. Um, but I see that in the Irish language, that one word needs mainly four words to describe that word. Is it like that in French or? I don't know. I Sometimes I feel like we have one word in French that needs two or three words in English, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's the opposite. I yeah. think every language has those words that tells a lot. And that other language say in many words, mm. but yeah, and <laughs> and in terms of of language, French, English, and other languages, um, is it um? There, show people silly Sammy. Anybody who's on the YouTube channel will see the picture of silly Sammy there. But in um, when you're looking at the different languages languages i was talking to a chinese translator and she was saying like there's a whole other language it's a different language three than the european languages because it's everything the character it's an art form really to get it right as a young child learning how to write chinese but um european languages is there 
a, so, a strong cultural difference between Europeans in their language? Is there strong, is, does it come through in the writing? Is, is there a big divide between us or are we more or, more or less the same? I would say no. I was going to say when you mentioned Chinese, I was going to say, yeah, it must have been really hard to translate because even the culture is different. So mm -hmm. the connotation must be different as well. I'd say between English and French, there's not such a big contrast. Mm -hmm. There are many words in English that mean the same in French. So we're coming from the Latin, so we're coming from Latin comes into English, French, Italian, Spanish. Yeah, yeah. and so English influenced French and French influenced English, so. Mm. Yeah. I don't know what influenced Irish, to be honest with you. I'd have to look that up. Um, but yeah, you can see, I've noticed that with French, that some words are similar uh, in English. Um, so yeah, I can see with the Latin that comes through in the, in the core of the, that tree, that language tree of Latin. Yeah. Um, is there, in your experience of translation, because I, I meet people every day of the week and they say, why don't you just use Google Translate? Um, so in your experience of translation, what is the difference between Google Translate and actual, and actual translation as you see it? Well, I think that's everything we just discussed. It's Picking the title, if you had translated silly into idiot or stupid in French, nobody would have bought the book. It would have been very offensive for the book itself and for Sami. Mm. So you cannot just translate literally because you have Google Translate doesn't tell the story. Google Translate just it tells the word, it tells the, the, the text, but it doesn't tell the story. And the translator is here to change words into a real story with emotions and an atmosphere and yeah and I, I think when I look at Google Translate and I and I work with translators every day I think um I don't know if we'll ever be able to get a computer to be able to feel the feelings that a translator needs to feel to translate properly um and that may happen but um I think um we're very lucky to have people to translate. Is translation something that you think you will continue to do? Would you like to continue to translate books? Do you have a love for translation? Do you have a love for languages? Tell us if I can. Yeah, I, I'd like to because it was a really nice experience and I like playing with languages. I am passionate about languages, so... Yes, it's definitely something I'd like to try. And I would recommend anyone who can, like who speaks both languages, to try translating something because it's very interesting and you have to ask yourself the right questions. So it's very interesting. We meet a lot of parents now in Ireland and more so than we ever had before, like because uh, we have Irish and English. And then we meet a lot of parents, a lot of Polish people have come to live in Ireland or Syrian now, or we have Spanish, Italian, French, German. There's a lot of European individual citizens in Ireland and um, they're rearing children, raising their children uh, with two languages. And, and sometimes um, they run into trouble because of the, the child gives them cheek and the child is bold and gives back cheek to the man. They say it in the language that the mother doesn't understand or the father doesn't understand. So the mother might be French and, and she mightn't have excellent English or the father might be Polish and he mightn't have excellent English or whatever. But the child then speaks another language for fun. And I saw it recently in supermarkets where this Irish woman had two children and a boy and a girl. And the little boy was, uh, his big sister was teasing him, but she was teasing him in Polish. And the mother could see that he was getting upset, but she didn't have the Polish to understand what was happening. And she told her daughter, leave him alone now. Let him, you know, he's just, he's minding his own business. He's being fine. He's relaxed. He's not disturbing you. Leave him alone. And she gave back cheek to her mother in Polish. And the mother didn't know what she, she meant. And she just stood there and looked at her child and she said, look, we're going home. We're going home. 
<laughs> but it's quite, we meet a lot of scenarios like this now in Ireland and it's hilarious in some respects, but in other respects, it must be so difficult for parents. And I see now with um, the area that you're in and that, that there is a scope now for books, children's books, with two languages within the one book. Mm -hmm. And that you're almost, um, you're integrating both languages. You're, it's like as if it's normal, it's natural for people to transfer between languages. And that can be good for parents to try and help their children not to be so bold and cheeky. Mm -hmm. And um, it can help parents too to learn another language. Yep. I think. Um, and I see that starting to creep into books now. What's your view on that? Oh, well, that's, that's, don't start me on this, but I am actually studying uh, plurilingual and bilingual books for my thesis. Okay. Oh, I really like that. But um, the thing is, there are more and more bilingual books, but most of them are just translated literally. I mean, not Google mm -hmm. Translate, but it's a literal yeah. translation. Yeah. So it can be a good thing, for instance, when both parents don't speak the same language. I mean, they share a common language, but they have two different mother tongue. Yeah. It's a good thing because both parents can read the same story. Mm. But on the other hand, when you really are bilingual, you're going to switch languages very naturally. And mm. you're not going to say the same things twice. Mm. And you know the child, if if he likes Polish better than English, he's going to read the story in Polish. Mm. If he has better English than Polish, he's not going to bother reading the story in Polish. Yeah. So it could be interesting to have bilingual books that actually mix both languages mm. so that it would be closer to natural bilingualism. But on the other hand, those bilingual books are a good way for parents to share a common story and mm. Yeah. Let's see, let's see what happens. I am so excited to see what the future of, of multilingualism, bilingualism, but multilingualism is. I, you know, I can't wait to see how freely because the world has become so so open to exploration, digital exploration. I can go on to um I don't have to go and find a dictionary in the corner, I could just go on to um Google or the internet and search for key words or, and then I can press the audio so I can understand how to pronounce them. And that means that my world has opened up to new languages. And it's just incredible at the moment that we can explore other languages so freely without having to leave our home. And we can integrate, we can talk to people that we could never speak to before. And now that we could possibly bring the love of language to our children with books that, that mix language within the book, it's an exciting world that lies ahead. Um, so I can't wait to read your thesis. You might have to translate it to English for me. Well, I, I'm not sure I'm going to do that. <laughs> I can't wait to read the conclusion of your, of your thesis. Maybe you'll translate the conclusion. Um, okay. But I can't wait to hear how that works out with all the research that you're doing, how that will work out for you. Um, because there are so many exciting things happening in languages at the moment that it's so, as a book publisher, it's and as a writer myself, it's so exciting um, to see how everything will work out in the world. Um, Lali, thank you so much for being part of this. Um, podcast series and also for you're here on youtube channel as well thank you so much for the time you've taken out of your day to talk to me um i wish you every success in your thesis and every success thank going forward in your translation work thank, thank you bye-bye now